Ferns are an interesting group of plants. They can be quite difficult to identify. And they have their own nomenclature, that is, this whole structure here is known as a frond, whilst the base that I've cut off is the rachis, and on it has scales or rementa. Many ferns, if you turn them over, will have these what are now brown structures. These are the spore carrying structures. Sometimes they're covered with a membrane, which is called an indusium. Other times they're just straightforwardly open, in which case what you're seeing is the sori. The sori are small structures that actually contain the spores. Now it's these characteristics that differ between the different species. You sometimes even mix up a fern with a flowering plant. Now the big difference of course is that flowering plants will have a flower structure if you seek it. This is a tansy leaf for instance. One of the most obvious things about ferns is the structure of the frond. So this first example here isn't divided up at all. This is the heart's tongue fern, so called because of resemblance to a male deer's tongue. Second example here is divided once, so it's unipinnate. It's what's called a common polypity. You'll often see it growing on the bark of trees, what's called an epiphyte, growing separately on another plant. This example here, the golden male fern, has got its division twice, so it's bipinnate. You can also have it divided again, which gives you a tripinnate, a very delicate structure. Another thing to look for in ferns is how they carry their spores. This first example is a, a royal fern, a native species. But here, some of the fronds have specialised, so the tips become a spore-carrying structure. So they're not in the individual parts of the frond, they are a, a separate structure at the top of it. So the leaf-like structures are not carrying the spores. Hart's tongue fern has very obvious spores carried beneath on the undersurface, but next to it you have one of the shuttlecock fern group. The shuttlecocks, as in badminton, here you've got the very distinct, very different looking structure, whilst it has more normal looking fronds as well, which have no similarity in appearance. And next to it is an even more extreme example. This is the fragile fern. Whilst its non-spore carrying fronds look entirely normal in appearance. So these are specialised. Very common group of the male shield ferns. This one on the left is the common male shield fern, Teropterus skilix mass. Whilst next to it is the golden male fern or scaly male fern, Teropterus affinis. Here you can tell the difference in terms of the, the lack of scales on the common one. However, they do have in common though is what looks like a shield. The shield is the indusium, that's a cover that goes over the sori that contain the spores. So what they have in common is this very similar appearance to the indusium structure. So you're looking for some other characteristic to tell them apart. There's another of the shield ferns. This is the hard shield fern. It's not carrying any spores, but the characteristic that really stands out is not all the pinna are the same length. So the ones closest to the central stem, if you like, are much longer. One thing about all ferns is that they unwind from what they call a circinate structure, like a shepherd's crook. So when they open up, they unfurl, which is quite different than uh, flowering plants. One thing that could be confusing is that uh, some ferns produce what's called sports, basically mutations. So this is a, on the right is a normal heart's tongue fern. On the left, there's an abnormal one, a sport. You can see how the tip has become divided two or three times. 
over here, this specimen is a, or that of a lady fern, but again, it's a sport. It's a pinner, or very much thinner than the normal. These, though, are highly prized for gardens. Of course, people would collect them, the Victorians in particular. Uh, in fact, they collected them to the point of almost extinction of some of these varieties of these sports. This brown powder is the spores from one of the fern species. Vast amounts are released. It can be quite useful in the uh, club moss group. Uh, there's a the powder the eastern collected from those can in very large quantities because it's a very common plant in Scandinavia. It's used uh, for such things as um, coating pills because it's got great waterproofing properties. It's also used as lycopodium powder in the, ex in the exploding can experiment in science where you blow air through this powder with a candle and it all, the, the explosive mixture blows the lid off the can. Ferns were a puzzle to botanists for many years in that they didn't appear to have any seeds and these, this fine powder was thought to be the equivalent of the pollen of flowering plants. That led to some strange thoughts. It was believed, for instance, that um, plants, seeds or fern group were invisible and these spores and somehow were responsible for making them invisible. So the, the folk belief developed that you could make yourself invisible by covering yourself with the, the spores of a fern. It was later discovered that the spores were a sort of seed, but they had a complex life cycle. This is a tray of small ferns and mosses. The mosses are quite easy to distinguish. Some of the small ferns can be seen developing with their circinate frond, the unfurling frond. But the stage here is called a gametophyte. A gametophyte looks a bit like one of these things called a liverwort, but is not related at all. Because what happens is this is the structure that grows from the spores of the fern. And it carries both male and female structures, which then cause fertilization to take place. And then from it, to so growing out of it, is the typical fern that people would recognise. So to the left there is an example of a heart's tongue fern developing from the gametophyte. So it's a very unusual life cycle.